Nobody wants to be a chump. Nobody wants to be overcharged. And most people, when they travel, are interested in having a culturally insightful experience, including or perhaps even especially when it comes to food. Unfortunately, not all restaurants may have your best interests in mind. So today we are talking about how to avoid tourist trap restaurants. We'll cover location tips, warning signs on the menu, tricks your server might try on you, and specific techniques to help you find the most local of local restaurants so you can enjoy the best possible food and cultural experience on your next trip. Stick around to the end for a very tricky tourist restaurant scam that can leave a very bitter taste in your mouth. See what I did there? Bitter taste? Restaurant? Food? Let's do this. So why go to lengths to dodge these tourist trap restaurants? I mean, I like to say that as much as some travelers preach about getting off the beaten path, some tourist attractions exist for a reason, because there's something amazing to see. So wouldn't this apply to restaurants as well? Sadly, not so much. At their core, restaurants geared towards tourists are more about the business of tourism than the art of cuisine. Their main objective is to attract a high volume of customers. It's not about relishing in the local culinary traditions, it's about turning tables quickly, often at the expense of service and food quality. And because these restaurants are catering specifically to foreigners, the menu might be filled with generalized, overpriced dishes designed to appeal to the broad tastes of tourists, rather than offering a true taste of local cuisine. I am particularly passionate about this topic because, well, I'm a foodie first, but also I believe food is a window into culture, history, and the essence of a destination. Some of the most memorable travel experiences I've had revolved around food and often finding my way into super local places and connecting with the place that I'm visiting on a deeper level through that restaurant experience. Here are three quick reasons why it's important to dine at local restaurants before I get into the top ways to make sure that you avoid the tourist traps. First and foremost, eating at local restaurants is a direct investment in the community. These businesses are often family owned or they're small enterprises that put their heart and soul into what they offer. By choosing these places, your money stays within the community, supporting local farmers, producers, and entrepreneurs. It's a way to contribute positively to the local economy. Also, there is no better way to understand a place than through its food. Local eateries offer the authentic flavors that define the very place itself. These are dishes that have been perfected over generations, made with local ingredients and traditional methods. It's not just about eating, it's about experiencing a piece of the culture, one bite at a time. The last and often overlooked benefit of dining at local spots is the potential to save money. Tourist traps with their inflated prices capitalize on visitors' lack of knowledge. Locals know how much a dish should cost, and if you're going to eat somewhere they go, you'll be paying local prices. It's a win-win. You get to enjoy better meals while also keeping your travel bucket budget in check. All right, let's dive into the practical tips and strategies to help you find the best local eateries and stay out of the bad ones. Let's start with the menu because there are a ton of warning signs right in the menu if you know what to look for. Many tourist restaurants will have their menu prominently displayed in front of the restaurant. However, this in itself isn't necessarily an indication that it's a tourist restaurant. Some countries and cultures do this even at local places. In fact, it's a good thing to see the menu before you commit to dining somewhere, especially if you know the tips that I'm about to share. So if the menu isn't displayed somewhere outside the restaurant, you can step inside and ask to see the menu before you sit down. Here are six things to look out for. Imagine strolling down a charming cobblestone street lined with quaint eateries. You're searching for a spot to savor some local cuisine and there it is. A menu showcasing tantalizing local dishes in not one, but five different languages. While multilingual menus are convenient, they're often the first telltale sign of a tourist trap restaurant. Locals don't need foreign language menus, so a foreign language menu is a sure first fire sign that this place is not for them, it's for tourists. Now, in some cases, you might find the local restaurants have English menus or English components to their menus, and they're still relatively authentic restaurants. But when you see a menu that reads more like a United Nations document, it's time to raise a red flag. There's also no reason to be intimidated by a foreign language menu. The easiest way to decipher them is with Google Translate. There's a camera function that allows you to simply point your camera at the menu and it instantly translates it for you. I talk more about this in my episode about best apps for travel, including some specific things you need to do to make sure Google Translate works for you when you need it. 
So I'll leave a link in the description and the first comment to that episode, which you can watch next. The next warning sign is a menu that displays prices in several currencies. Again, it's targeting diners who haven't yet exchanged their travel funds or who might be unfamiliar with the local currency. A restaurant that accepts foreign currencies is probably going to offer a very poor exchange rate or they're going to tack on hidden fees. There are a few exceptions to this rule in countries that deal regularly in multiple currencies. Costa Rica is an example that I personally experienced where most places have price lists in the local colon as well as US dollars. That said, once when I paid for a meal with US dollars and got Cologne back in change, I thought I'd done the math right in my head, but it wasn't until much later that I realized I had been significantly shortchanged. My advice is to stick to the local currency. Check out my episode about ways to exchange your money abroad to ensure you're getting the best possible rates. The next warning sign that you're at a touristic restaurant is a menu filled with pictures. Gleaming booklets filled with glossy photos might be pretty and easy to order from, but in most cases it's a sign you're in the wrong place. Again, there are always exceptions. I've been to lots of local places in Southeast Asia, for example, that do have pictures on their menu as standard practice. Also, in Japan, they sometimes take it to the next level with full-on plastic replicas of various dishes displayed in the front window. The trick to all of these warning signs, and ultimately to finding local restaurants, is in reading between the lines and using your intuition. In a few minutes, you'll have not only the warning signs of places to avoid, but I'll also give you some positive things to look for that are clues that the place that you're at is the real deal. This next warning sign is particularly subjective, and it's around pricing. If the menu is overpriced, it's likely not going to be somewhere that a local will eat if it's local food that they know that they can get elsewhere for less. That said, some authentic restaurants will charge more because they offer an elevated dining experience or particularly high quality food. Also, when you're new to a destination, you're not likely gonna know what the normal price is until you've eaten at a few places. I do two things to get a sense of local prices. The first thing is I research in advance what the local specialty is of the region, as in the dish that's most likely to be on most menus. I also research the average price for that dish. That's my starting point. Then, when I arrive, I compare the prices of the same dish at different restaurants. I learned this trick when I was in Indonesia and I compared the prices of nasi goreng, which is a popular fried rice dish. Now, like I said, if it's a nicer restaurant, they'll naturally charge more and you may get what you pay for. I remember one particular overpriced nasi goreng that had amazing presentation and was the most delicious one that I ate in my two months there, bar none. So, it's subjective. Another similar trick is to compare the price of local beer. That will actually be a more accurate indication of how much markup is being applied and in turn, how much the place caters to locals versus tourists. Speaking of prices, any lack thereof should be noted and treated with caution. It's a classic technique in tourist trap restaurants to get people invested in the idea of a dish before they've considered the cost. It's easy to get caught up in the holiday spirit and not want to spoil the moment by talking about money, but that omission could cost you dearly. So if there isn't a price, ask up front before you order. A reputable restaurant will have no issue giving you the actual price. Sometimes the price is legitimately blank because the ingredients are seasonal and the price changes. The last menu warning sign is overly salesy language. Look at the layout and ask yourself if you're being sold something. For example, if the country's national dish is prominently displayed in a box with a box around it saying that it's the national dish with a bunch of exclamation marks or something like that, you're probably in the wrong place. Locals don't need to be told it's the national dish. So this is a tactic geared 100% towards tourists. A bonus warning sign here in the section about menus is something to be very careful with and it's the items that aren't on the menu. Let's say you've sidestepped the menu minefields that I've discussed so far and you've picked your place. You sit down, and as the server hands you the menu, they also recite a list of delicious specials not found on the menu. Daily specials can be a legitimate treat, showcasing the freshest ingredients or a creative dish that the chef just concocted. But when these recommendations come without price tags, you might be in for a nasty surprise a little too late when you get your bill. Again, don't be afraid to ask how much that daily special is, if they don't mention the price up front. A few moments of discomfort and asking could save you a few days of regret if you end up being overcharged. Next up, let's look at two crucial location-based warning signs. Because sometimes the tourist trap is set long before you even glimpse that menu. If it's really close to a major landmark or a tourist attraction, 
it's likely to be an overpriced touristy restaurant. It's so obvious it almost is bare mentioning, right? Well, I'm gonna throw in a bit of nuance here, just to be different. Many years ago, my mom and I met up in France and we were enjoying the sights of Paris together along with a friend who lived there. On one particular hot sunny day near the Arc du Triomphe, we were a bit tired and hungry. Now, if left to my own devices, I would have continued walking away from the Arc de Triomphe and down random side streets in search of a local place to have lunch. But my mom didn't have the energy for it, and she insisted that we sit at one of these super touristy restaurants on the Champs-Élysées. Initially, I was mortified. I did not want to be caught dead in one of these obvious tourist trap restaurants, nor did I want anything to do with the bill that would inevitably be inflated. I'm not gonna lie, the food was mediocre at best, and the bill was inflated. Luckily, because it was lunch, we stuck to super simple dishes, so it wasn't as expensive as dinner would have been. And there was no denying what we were ultimately paying for, which was an incredible view. We sat on the most famous street in Paris while enjoying one another's company and sipping a nice cool beverage. So as much as this entire episode is about how to avoid tourist trap restaurants, and as much as I would not have eaten there if I was in charge, I did enjoy the ambiance and the company, and it's not a lunch that I will soon forget. If you find yourself near a spectacular landmark and you want to take it all in, in a similar fashion, I recommend just having a drink at that touristy restaurant and eating somewhere else. That way you get the best of both worlds, a chance to soak in the sights in style and a relaxed fashion, and then a truly local meal afterwards. Maybe you're not in sight of the Arc du Triomphe, but you wander into a restaurant that is selling souvenirs near the entrance, or there's a souvenir shop just next door. This is a sign the restaurant is catering to tourists, and you're not likely going to get a very good deal, nor a very good meal. Aside from location and menu clues, here are two more dead giveaways that should send you running in the opposite direction. I don't envy the people who are hired to stand outside restaurants and convince people passing by to come inside. I also don't like being that passerby who's getting hassled. But it's a common practice, so it must work on some people. With any luck after watching this episode, you won't be one of them. Aggressive marketing tactics are rarely, if ever, a sign of a high quality or local restaurant. And chances are, if you go inside, you're going to find a menu with pictures, multiple languages, and dubious prices. In our quest for a dining experience that feels genuine and deeply connected to the local culture, we often seek out something authentic. But paradoxically, the louder a restaurant shouts about its authenticity, the more skeptical we need to be. If you see the word authentic, on the restaurant's signage, or their marketing materials, or their menus, it's likely not authentic. Authenticity in its truest form is lived and breathed, not sold. When a restaurant has to constantly proclaim its authenticity, it begs the question, who are they trying to convince? Now that we've been through the red flags, let's look at six positive signs that you're at an authentic restaurant. After that, I'll share some common restaurant scams to be on the lookout for. The most straightforward yet effective tip is to look for restaurants filled with locals. If residents are there, it's a sign that you'll get not just good food, but also an authentic atmosphere that's true to its roots. If you're in a foreign language country, then you get bonus points if the wait staff doesn't speak much or any English. Now, the only way you're going to find a restaurant filled with locals is to know when they actually eat their meals. Dining times can vary greatly from one culture to another, and restaurants that cater primarily to locals will adhere to these traditional schedules. For instance, in Spain, dinner doesn't generally start until after 9 p.m., while in other places, like the United States, it's common to eat around 6 or 7 p.m. Researching local dining times before your trip can also help you avoid the disappointment of finding closed doors. Many authentic local restaurants may not open for dinner until later in the evening, or they might close in the afternoon between lunch and dinner service. Being aware of these patterns can help you plan your own day accordingly. Also, getting away from the main tourist areas and venturing into neighborhoods where communities live, work, shop, and play together will help you find the places where they also eat together. These restaurants will cater to the local clientele, not to tourists. Not only that, but exploring these areas will give you a glimpse into the everyday lives of locals. You can observe the nuances of local etiquette, the seasonal variations in cuisine, and maybe you'll even pick up a few phrases in the local language. Checking online reviews is a great way to see if the restaurant has good food and a quality experience. Personally, I like to use Google Maps because it's pretty commonly used by people and it's easy to find restaurants, check out menus, and leave reviews. But regardless of the review platform that you're looking at, not all reviews are created equal. You want to find the ones left by locals. 
Here are a couple of strategies. First, read between the lines. Reviews written by visitors might focus on different aspects of the dining experience than locals would. Tourists might comment on the novelty of the cuisine or the view or the ambiance, whereas locals are more likely to write about the quality of specific dishes or compare them to other local restaurants or they'll mention repeat visits. Also, look for language clues. If you're in a foreign language destination, reviews written in that language are a strong indicator that they were written by residents. Google Maps will automatically translate the review and they'll tell you it's a translation. I like using Google Maps for a whole bunch of reasons, which I get much more into in detail in my video about best travel apps, which again, I linked to below. But one reason I didn't mention in that video is that Google Maps can give me an additional clue that the restaurant is the real deal by showing me when it's the busiest. Because you've already researched the local dining times, which I talked about a minute ago, it's easy to cross-reference that information with the restaurant's busy times on Google Maps. For example, if you're in Spain and the restaurant is busiest from 6 to 8 p.m., that's a surefire sign that is popular with tourists and not locals. And of course, another great way to find a local restaurant is to ask locals where to go. There are a few tricks to this though. First, be specific. Instead of asking for a good place to eat, Narrow down your request. Are you looking for the best local dish or a casual neighborhood hangout or a place for a special meal? The more specific you are, the more meaningful the recommendations will be. Also, ask a few people. Don't just ask hotel staff or tour guides because they may even have special arrangements with certain restaurants to send them business. Instead, strike up conversations with shopkeepers, taxi drivers, market vendors, or even just people you meet randomly. Also, have a look online. Local food bloggers, culinary groups, or community pages can be excellent resources for up-to-date advice from food-savvy residents. Okay, if you've watched this far and you use all of these tips, you'll probably be able to avoid the most touristy of tourist restaurants. But even with the best of intentions, you might find yourself in one for one reason or another. And that's totally cool. Like I said, I will never forget that lunch that I had on the Champs-Élysées, even though it cost me an arm and a leg. Here's the trick. While not all places are out to deceive you or rip you off, there are some common practices that can lead to unexpected costs. Knowledge is power and understanding these potential pitfalls will help you ensure that they don't happen to you. One of the first surprises is the cover charge just for taking a seat. If it's not disclosed up front, it can be particularly annoying. In some cases, restaurants justify this charge by including bread, olives, or small appetizers that you didn't actually order. Here's how to avoid an unexpected cover charge. First, look around the restaurant entrance or the menu for any mention of a cover charge. Also, if you're in doubt, you can ask the staff. It's also important to understand local customs. In some cultures, cover charges at restaurants are standard practice. Knowing the dining customs in advance can help you set your own expectations. Another common pitfall in tourist-oriented restaurants is the addition of extra items to your bill that were never ordered or received. This works on the assumption that tourists who are out of their element and may or may not speak the local language may overlook the details of their bill. Or you may see something that isn't right, but you don't want to rock the boat by questioning it too much, so you just pay it. Sadly, some places are counting on that. Here's how to safeguard against this issue. First, review your bill carefully. If you're not sure what a charge is for, don't hesitate to ask. Second, keep a mental note or even a written note of what you ordered. This makes it easier to spot any discrepancies when the bill arrives. Next, if you do find something off with the bill, address it calmly with the staff. It might just be a mistake and a reputable place will fix it right away. Don't forget, if you're dealing with language barriers, translation apps can help bridge the gaps, whether it's using the microphone option to have a somewhat fluid conversation with your server or using the camera function to scan and translate the menu and or your bill. Another tactic that can catch diners off guard, especially in tourist focused restaurants, is the automatic addition of a gratuity or service charge to the bill. Sadly, the Champs-Élysées restaurant wasn't my only rodeo with tourist restaurants on that trip to Paris. In another place that pretty obviously catered to tourists, our group of four couldn't understand why our bill was so high. Nobody scrutinized it in that moment though because we were in a rush and we just paid the bill along with a tip. It wasn't until we were long gone that I had a closer look at the bill and I realized we double tipped. Now, it's common for restaurants around the world to charge auto gratuity for larger groups. And some restaurants will do it regardless of the size of the group, especially if they cater to tourists who are of a nationality that aren't accustomed to tipping. 
but the reputable ones will disclose the service charge, usually somewhere on the menu. So keep an eye out for that. We obviously missed that in Paris. It also helps to research local tipping culture, which can be easily done online. I also like using the app TipFox, which tells you what the customary tips are for various services around the world. Last up, drum roll please, is a proper scam that some unscrupulous restaurants may use on unsuspecting tourists. It's the different price scam. This happens when the prices on the menu are lower than the final prices on your bill. It works on the assumption that diners won't remember what the exact prices are of what they ordered, or they won't bother to compare the bill against the menu. Luckily, it's a pretty easy scam to avoid being a victim of. Before you order, and especially if you suspect the restaurant might be a bit dodgy, take a photo of the menu pages with your phone. This gives you a reference to compare against your bill. If there is a discrepancy between the menu prices and your bill, you can show the photo that you took as evidence. Most places will have no choice but to correct the mistake once it's pointed out. Sadly, this scam isn't just relegated to tourist trap restaurants, though foreigners who are out of their element unfortunately make for excellent targets. Because of this, it's important to familiarize yourself with local scams so you can see them coming and sidestep them gracefully. Speaking of scams, I have another episode about pickpocket scams that is a must-see, especially if you're headed to Europe. You'll see it come up on the very next screen, and you can just click on it to keep watching. I'm Nora Dunn, aka The Professional Hobo, and I'll catch you next time. Thank you.